first one ever walk in space was Alexei Leonov, but he went out for about 12 minutes. And, and the problem, all we saw was just maybe 30 seconds of film that shows him floating around and the subtitles said, look, see, no problems. We saw that, said, gee, that looks like a piece of cake. So I was supposed to do the first space walk. It's kind of a semi, really we just stand up in the hatch with a double linked hose, kind of turn around like that and get back in and close the hatch. But when, after Leonardo said, we, Americans have to respond so real fast, they kludged up a little blow down chest back and put Ed White out. Ed White went out for 22 minutes. And when he came back in, his suit balloon, you know, just like the Michelin man, you see those ads. But the, the critical part was the height, because you had to put, call it the alley oop maneuver, get under, grab a bar underneath the instrument handle, and put, put, uh, pull your knees back and scooch down, and then with one hand, you had to reach up and ratchet a hatch on long. It was about that far, and Ed couldn't get in. He, he's, I guess his adrenaline was really moving. His heart rate went well over 220 beats a minute, and he finally got in. So they made a, a, a quick device after that that I think helped save Cernan that I had to use. It was a beam, or I beam maybe two and a half feet long, hooked to the one edge of the hatch, and then a steel cable we hooked to the part of the spacecraft. Then I'd pull that, and that would slam the hatch down. Cernan would still have to lock it home because I could not reach over there with my suit was inflated too, and where the handle was. Anyway, what happened, we were suiting up in this kind of a double mobile home trailer over on pad 16, and I had my suit on, I getting ready to put my helmet on, and Deke Slate, my boss, uh, gave me a, told the suit tech, get out of here, I gotta talk. So he shuts the door and says, Tom, I wanna tell you, NASA management has decided, you know, that if we have any problems out there, and the Cernan dies out there, you know, he says, you gotta bring him back. We cannot afford to have a dead American astronaut in orbit around the Earth. I look at him, I said, Deke, this is a hell of a time to tell me this. Here we are, coming down two hours before launch. We've never discussed that. I started to think real fast. I said, look, all I have is two rows of 25 pound thrusters. You can see them over to the museum on Chimney 6. And to, to hold the attitude, we didn't have an autopilot. The commander had to, when the retro rockets fired in sequence before, you had to control them to get the right vector in to get captured. So, and then he's on this tether that could go out to 125 feet. And when that would happen, that would torque that little spacecraft all over. I said, I didn't know when, if I'd ever get enough Delta V to get and I captured it. But suppose I did get a capture, and I, the hatch is still open, maybe this hot far. And uh, coming in, I said, that heat coming back in and reentry on a shape like that is 3,100 degrees Fahrenheit. I said, that fire is going to come right through there. And I had just a little double layer of suit. I said, how long do you think that's going to last with 3,100 degrees coming in on me? He just sat there with his couldn't say a word. And uh, I said, furthermore, if we get through that, do all the fireball and come down in, we're still going to be part of that umbilical. I had a bunch of insulation, the heavy stuff, some remnants left. If you go out to drogue chute, it could tangle up with the drogue chute. Or if I get through that, the main chute comes out. And so it could tangle up the main chute. Then when I hit the water, say I got through that, hit the water, the hatch would still be open. Says, remember Gus Grissom, what happened when his hatch went open in this spacecraft thing? He said, well, what shall I tell NASA management? Said, you tell them to remember that when those bolts explode and that Titan II lifts off, I'm the commander, I'll make the decision. I, by then, to put it bluntly, I was pissed. So I took, I took my helmet, slammed it on, locked the neck ring, and stormed out. Here's Gino out there waiting for me. They've been waiting quite a while. So we get in this little van. We didn't have communications in those days. We just up the ramp, up the elevator, into the spacecraft. Boom, we got plugged in. As soon as we got plugged in and had communications, Cernan asked me, hey, Tom, what was Deke talking to you about so long? I thought for a second. I said, Gino, he said he hoped we'd have a real good flight today. <laughs> 
we, we were in the spacecraft, we could hear the Atlas roar off a of patch 16. And, uh, but it didn't get too far. It got out over the Atlantic Ocean and it started doing loops and range safety. It had to hit the destruct button. So we lost that target. So they had a contingency plan that they would take the uh, some thrusters from a Gemini reentry system. You can see it there, those 25 pound thrusters, those two rings. In fact, that, this is the only part of Gemini that wasn't original. They took the, the original thrusters, ring, reentry thrusters from Gemini, and made the augment target, adopted adapter, refurbished the engines and the fuel tanks, and then put a batteries, transponder, a shroud over it, a docking collar. You know, so we could dock and uh, had telemetry on it. So they had a spacecraft. So they had uh, this is called the augmented ATDA, augmented target docking adapter, and we're to run it with that. So the Atlas could it was very light, so the Atlas could do it real easy, and so the Atlas got it in the space, but we didn't get an update for the azimuth, and so we, CERN and I scrubbed out there. So that was the second scrub out for Gemini 9. Uh, first, the, we didn't have the, the Gina blew up, and we stopped to count. And then the, uh, pardon me, the Atlas blew up, we stopped to count. Then the, uh, didn't get the update, so that came at three, T minus three minutes, so stopped the count there, so the third time. Took me three times on the pad to get ready to launch before I got off on both six and nine. All the other Geminis went right on time. I felt like this character in Little Abner called Joe Blitzblick that goes around with this cloud over it. And uh, anyway, we, the third time we got off, but they said they got a signal that the shroud hadn't completely deployed and the, uh, and the thing was in a, just a slow tumble. And, and right there you can see this thing's getting bigger and bigger. And it broke out in the sunlight. And here was this, I called it, I tried to describe it when it came out. So what's it look like? It was open like this. It had, so it looks like oh, maybe an angry alligator, I called it that, to describe it. So it looks like the shroud's open about 20, 20 to 30 degrees. And, and it's just slowly rotating. So I got in close. <coughs> Over station, they turned on command, and that stopped the rotation. But it was squirting fuel out, you know, because we run oxidizer rich. So I said, turn it off. It did slowly start rotating. So I, you know, Gemini was like a fighter plane compared to Apollo, very maneuverable. So I got the, the, the 16 millimeter camera right on 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 the window. So I, even though it was rolling, I got Gemini, and I got in within a foot or two of it, like that. And you could see what they did. The, it was a human error. 